Major funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional support provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Philip Chosky Charitable and Educational Foundation, the Posner Foundation of Pittsburgh, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My Uncle High was able to get uh, a visa um, to go in what, you know, in certain ways would be the most surprising direction. In the early 1930s, as Hitler was coming to power, many German and Austrian Jews fled to Shanghai. They rode out the war upwards of six or seven years in Shanghai. February 12, 1941, I was born in Shanghai. After 1938, after Kristallnacht, there were thousands and thousands of Jewish uh, refugees who were attempting to flee Europe. And I'm 14 years old. It never occurred to me that my father had a story, you know. It was a sort of moment in time that opened and then quickly shut. But while it was open, Jews were able to pour in. Shanghai actually became a place of refuge. It was sort of a little wrinkle in time. My name is Harry Waldbaum and my family was from Germany. My dad had several brothers and uh, sisters. My mother had uh, another sister. Eventually, um, the, when the Holocaust came, some of them perished and some of us survived. Kristallnacht came around 1938, and uh, after my dad was uh, interned at the Buchenwald, he, it was decided he had to get out of uh, Germany as fast as he could. You had waiting lists to go to various countries. He had a ticket for the United States or, or something, and it was a long number. He was able to trade this American number of tickets for Shanghai, and that's how we wound up in Shanghai. That was in 39. Shanghai was an open city. You didn't need a visa to get into Shanghai. If you could get there by boat or by train, and you, you were in. You didn't have to show any papers or anything. They had to go with whatever they had on their backs. Later on, it was worse for the refugees because they had nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing at all. In order to conquer the world, we must first conquer China. The Japanese began invading China in the 1930s, and they start in the north in Manchuria and gradually come closer and closer. And Shanghai is the prize. It's the wealthiest city of China. Thousands and thousands of Chinese eventually died from uh, execution, diseases, uh, whatsoever. February 12, 1941, I was born in Shanghai. There was a proclamation in 1943, in February, and they had to be in a certain area called the Hankou section. One reason the Jews are put in Hankou is that it was the worst part of Shanghai. It was a, a poor community, uh, and then it had been bombed very heavily by the Japanese uh, earlier in the 1930s. It wasn't only uh, 15,000 people that lived in Hankou. There were 100,000 people, which included uh, some Japanese families and Chinese. So I remember going to school or synagogue to the Ohel Moshe, and I remember sometimes walking through bodies. I had him cross over dead bodies, and uh, there were still people dying and starving, uh, mainly Chinese, I believe. There were two big schools. The main one was Kaduri School. So the kids went to school, kindergarten, excursions, and et cetera. And in the evenings, I would be outside uh, because it was so hot in the summer. And that's how I spent a lot of the time. The, the, and the, I remember the monsoons, and sometimes we went to the youth center. Life went on. 
we had a lot of diseases. We had to worry about the malnutrition. So it was pretty bad because uh, everything was, uh, how you say it, rationed. Ra ra and eventually it got even worse a year later. You had to learn how to boil water. <laughs> a lot of people didn't boil water and of course got real sick. We had tuber tuberculosis, we had dysentery, malaria, name it. I eventually wound up having uh, malaria. I was living, I believe, in the ghetto on Ward Street, Mott Road. If I looked outside the window, oh, about 100 feet across, the streets were real wide, I could see the courtyard the, and the uh, big jail and possibly the hospital. The another the thing I remember, there was another group of housing, which were called Himes, and these people were living like 200 or more in one area, I mean one home. End of 44, maybe early 45, and we got some air raids. I lived right across, of course, the um, bomb shelter. I remember the first time going in, and I remember it was my last time <laughs> because I think I caught, got claustrophobia. So whenever there was an air raid, I'd hide. July 17, I would believe 1945, and the, the big raid, and I remember that day very well. It was, I was in school, in one of the Kadori schools, and I guess it might have been elementary or something. I was about five at that time. Next thing uh, I heard, uh, one of the girls, one of the bigger girls come running and said, Harry, run, run. I, said, I, I, I heard the plane so I started running. As soon as I got out of the building, we were running, the explosion and the breach went flying all over us. Miraculously, we did it. We just kept running. There were so hundreds of people who were wounded and killed, and buildings burning, and the Japanese, Chinese, and the immigrants were helping the wounded. A few weeks later, something big happened in the world. The first bomb was on Hiroshima, the second bomb was on Nagasaki. Actually, the war was over. Then came the soldiers. I remember them very well. In America, they were giving out Hershey bars. And they started getting the news about uh, what was going on in Europe. Well, that hit them harder than what, while they were living in Shanghai, they couldn't believe it was worse. They found out how bad the Holocaust was and they lost their relatives, etc. And that was the worst news they ever got. We were eventually sponsored to go to America, and uh, we left in 1947, somewhere around June, I believe. We wound up in Cleveland. This is my mother, baby pictures. Okay, this is an album of me uh, in Shanghai. Some of the pictures of my mother and I as a baby. I met my wife in Erie, and then uh, she got a job here in Pittsburgh at the VA and I followed her and, and I stayed here since then. My parents, my dad, they never talked about World War I or Kristallnacht or World War II. Never. I think it changed her life completely. From something to nothing and all the property being taken away and uh, the hate of the, the Germans on, on the Jews at that time. And I just feel that I'm lucky I survived it. Why would some Chinese guy save a bunch of Austrian Jews? He really had no reason to. It's who he is. I am Feng Shan Ho's granddaughter. My father was his son. In 1938, after Anschluss, when the Nazis took over Vienna, he became the consul of the Chinese consulate. And at that time then, my grandfather was responsible for the, the Chinese uh, consulate in Vienna. He understood very quickly that um, according to an agreement that was signed by all the countries that there was a limitation 
to the number of Jews that the countries would accept. There was a quota, and he did not agree to this. He thought it was wrong. At the time, a lot of the Jews were lining up on the sidewalks surrounding all the consulates. My grandfather then began to sign visas for anybody who wanted them. The German allowed the Jews to leave Germany if they knew they had these visas, and he knew that not all the Jews would go to Shanghai. They just needed a visa to leave. These actually were entry visas. Basically, it's just a stamp in a passport that enabled the Jews to get a train ticket or to get a, a bus ticket or a, a boat ticket or anything. Uh, it just proved that another country would take them in. And understandably, my grandfather realized that probably uh, a great number of the Jews to whom he gave visas would not go to China uh, because of the distance, but he also realized that with just this stamp, they were able to at least leave Nazi-occupied countries. The whole reason that Shanghai was able to be the place in the world that were, was open and able to accept Jews was that within the chaos of the war within these two theaters, Europe and, and China, there was this small window of opportunity. In 1937, Japan invaded Shanghai and took over the Chinese portions of the city. After 1938, uh, after Kristallnacht, there were thousands and thousands of Jewish uh, refugees who were attempting to flee uh, Europe, and there weren't any ports open available uh, for them. Shanghai was a port in which nobody was really paying attention. Unfortunately, very few people did help the Jews, and diplomats were in a slightly different uh, position because they could issue visas, um, but unfortunately, very few diplomats did. The character for Shanghai mm -hmm. and his name. So here, uh, this would have been, uh, let's see. I recognize his name. We don't know the exact number of visas, but given the the number on the visas that were discovered, it is speculated that he wrote well into the thousands. They were very unhappy with him, and he was sent from Vienna. Why do you think Ye Ye never mentioned any of this while he was still alive? I don't think my grandfather meant to keep it as a secret. It just, it, it, it would have never occurred to him to talk about something like this because it, it, he just didn't think of it as anything spectacular, I think. Um, he thought of it more as something, I think, that anybody should have done in his position. That's kind of scary, isn't it? All you needed was a stamp and a passport. Yeah, and he knew that by issuing these visas, he was saving a life. So for my family, this is really our heirloom of my aunt and uncle's sojourn in Shanghai. This is, as far as we know, their Chinese marriage document. So my name is Daniel Yalkut. I'm the rabbi of Poli Tzedek in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh. My great-grandparents Yaakov and Sima Wynn built their family in Berlin. All of their children survived in different ways. Two boys made it to the United States in the early 30s. There were two children who made it to what was at that time British-controlled Palestine. In 1938, after Kristallnacht, all of the Jews of Eastern European descent were expelled from Germany. My grandmother with her parents went to Poland. My great-grandparents were shot by the Nazis. My grandmother actually got married in the ghetto to my grandfather in July of 1942, and they survived as employees of Oskar Schindler. But the story is about my great uncle um, and his wife, my great aunt, High and Rita Wind. Um, so my uncle High was able to get uh, a visa 
um, to go in what, you know, in certain ways would be the, the um, most surprising direction, um, that they wrote out the war um, for you know, upwards of six or seven years in Shanghai. Um, and that's actually where they married. They knew each other back in Berlin. She knew the family. Um, and she, with her parents and my un great uncle by himself, were in Shanghai and they got married together uh, in the ghetto. So when my great aunt passed on, her husband predeceased her by about 20 years, um, we actually have their Chinese marriage document um, that hangs in a prominent place in our dining room. We kind of have kept that as a memorial to that part of our family history. Um, and it's really, it's very important to my wife and to myself that our children have this sense of where they come from. The idea that both the calamity that befell the Jews of Europe um, during the Holocaust, but also kind of the remarkable and miraculous story of revival that came from there. And I'm 14 years old. It never occurred to me that my father had a story. I knew there was a Holocaust. I know my father's parents were killed, but that's all I knew. And his brother was killed. My father was a uh, Holocaust survivor who managed to escape through Shanghai. My father was 17 years old when the war broke out in, um, in Poland. So my father was born in Poland grew up in Warsaw, the son of a Hasidic family. September 1st, 1939, the Germans attacked Poland. According to my father, every able-bodied Polish male from the age of 17 to 50 was drafted into the Polish army. He, he was given 24 hours of basic training. And then he was sent to the front. The Panthers attacked. Their lines broke immediately. He escaped. Uh, my father went to rejoin his unit. They decided that they were going to do sort of hit and run stuff against the Germans. It turns out they had an informer in their midst and they were taken to a prisoner of war camp. He started his escape on the second day of Sukkot in 1939, but he had to make his way back to Warsaw because that's where his family was. Leaving Warsaw with no papers, his, he just went to any train that was going to any uh, neutral country. The first one that he could get on was to uh, Riga, Latvia. And then um, uh, the next part was going to Kovno, Kaunas in Lithuania. They weren't going to Shanghai. They were supposed to go to Macau or to one of the um, Caribbean islands. So the way you got there was to um, go through Japan. My father got to Japan with 110, 120 other guys in the hold of a, of a Japanese fishing trawler. They got caught in a typhoon. A Japanese Coast Guard cutter. They brought them to Yokohama, let the Jewish community in Kobe know that they were still alive. So that's where they were. And so from, I'm gonna say from February, March, something like that, 1940, till eight, May, April 1941, the Mir Yeshiva was two weeks ahead of them. The Mir Yeshiva was the preeminent advanced school of Talmud learning, st Talmud study and rabbinical academy in Europe at the time. It was the equivalent, in Judaism, it would be the equivalent of Harvard. Somewhere in February, March, the leaders of the Jewish community were told that um, they received an order that they were going to, that the Jewish community was going to be moved from Kobe to Shanghai. When he got to Shanghai in 41, they were taken to what was the Jewish quarter. They were just dumped, literally just dumped there fend for yourselves. My father found a room and he had to make a living. The Mir Yeshiva, they needed Chalav Yisrael. Kosher milk in Judaism, one is enjoined from 
having milk from any animal that is not kosher. The, the main ones that we have are uh, kosher animals that are domesticated are sheep, goats, and cows. My father offered to them to start a milk business so that he could make a living. He had to get a special permit from the Japanese authorities to be able to leave early in the morning through contacts. He found a Chinese farmer who was willing to sell him just cow's milk. Father said he had a 50 gallon jug on handlebars of a, um, of a bicycle. And he used to get up at 3.30 in the morning and he had this permit to be able to leave. When the winter came, it was horrendous because he was one of the few people that actually had a source of income. People starved to death. He said people were in the ghetto. You were walking, literally walking over frozen bodies in the street. But he managed to stay healthy. He said the greatest day in Shanghai was VJ Day. When the announcement came over that the Japanese had been vanquished and surrendered, they were all still poor as hell and starving. Uh, many people were starving, um, but th they didn't care. And then the doors were, were thrown open. They could leave. What he said was, I want to go where my family is. We know that they were killed in Auschwitz in 1943. His mother's brother had come to the United States in the 1920s to New York City. He was 24 when he came to the United States. Everybody else was dead. You know, and, um, you know, it, I think it took about a month. Um, and then he found a job. And, uh, and through that job, he met my mother. My father started to tell the story. The story that I heard the first time was seared into my brain. It was his refuge because it was a place that he felt semi-safe, that he could get out of once a week and had the ability to earn a living that benefited him, his friends, and the yeshi and and the rabbinical academy, the Mir Yeshiva. Shanghai was his refuge and his torture at the same time. Lucy Hartwich was my aunt. During the war, she was one of the lucky ones that managed to get out with her husband and uh, to, to Shanghai. You remember the uh, Kristallnacht, Crystal Night. On the morning of the 9th or, or 10th, I don't remember, uh, our phone rang very early in the morning and Lucy said, don't you know what's going on in the streets? They're smashing all the uh, Jewish stores, windows, and they're hauling uh, Jewish men uh, to, well, we don't know where to, actually. And at the end, Lucy said, I'm going to try and find a place to, to, to emigrate to. And she managed to get passage to Shanghai. She had had a school for Jewish children in Berlin because at a, at a certain point before Crystal Night, uh, Jewish children couldn't go to, to public schools and Jewish ch teachers couldn't teach on the ship which carried them to, to the Far East were many, many of her students from Berlin with their families. Lucy realized that uh, the people, hardly anybody knew good enough English to find a job when they got to the other end. So she went to the ca captain of the ship and she said, will you let me have your dining rooms when you don't need them? And 
the captain said, well, what are you going to do with the dining rooms? And he, she said, I'm going to have everybody t speaking English. On the ship was a very wealthy man by the name of Horace Kaduri. The Kaduri family is a very famous family of uh, philanthropists and uh, people who helped save many Jews. And uh, Horace Kaduri was very interested in this woman, what she was doing. When they were about a, a week or so out of Shanghai, he said to Mrs. Artwich, there are already many hundreds, if not thousands, of Jewish refugees in Shanghai, and the children need an education. And he said, we will need to have a school for those children, and I'm going to provide the school, and you, and you will head the school when we get to the other end. Life at the Kaduri School was, for me, one of the most important things of Shanghai. It gave me the education I had, and I always say I most probably would have grown up illiterate if it wouldn't have been for that. People were able to communicate, but here for the first time, they learned a common language, English. And that's, I think, was a, a very important part of uh, the Kaduri School. She was a great educator. Everybody says that, um, you know, she had a calling. She really had a calling. I look at it and I think about all the upheaval that they faced. My mother and her aunts and her own mother, they all went to ends of the earth, you know, before there was the internet and before you knew what was there. They were just, you know, getting on a boat and having no idea what they faced at the other end. 